Αγαπητοί συνάδελφοι, καλησπέρα. Καλώ ήρθατε και απόψε στα μαθήματα τη Τρίτη του Ιπποκρατείου. Είναι η πρώτη Τρίτη του Νοεμβρίου. Να, ευχ... να ευχηθώ καλό μήνα. Χρόνια πολλά στου εορτάζοντε σήμερα α, και όλα να πάνε καλά. Η επόμενη Τρίτη θα είναι μια εξαιρετική βραδιά. Είναι αφιερωμένη στη Στεφανία Νόσο. Έχουμε τη χαρά να τη συντονίσουν δύο α, παλέμαχοι καρδιολόγοι. Α, ο, καθ... ο κύριος Καλικάζαρος, διευθυντής χρόνια στο Ιπποκράτειο και τώρα στο διευθυντής του τομέα καρδιάς και αγγείων στο Metropolitan General, μαζί με τον Στέφανο το Φούσα, συντονιστή διευθυντή του τομέα καρδιάς και αγγείων στο Metropolitan General, α, χρόνια διευθυντής στον Τζάνιο ο κύριος Φούσας και οι δύο πρόεδροι της ελληνικής καρδιολογικής εταιρεία την προηγούμενη περίοδο με εξαιρετική συνεισφορά και θα έχουμε τρεις διακεκριμένους καρδιολόγους, τον Διευθυντή τον Νίκο τον Καυκά για τις επιπλοκές του Εμμοδυναμικό Εργαστήριο για τη σύγχρονη αντιμετωπισή του από το ΚΑΤ, τον Λεωνίδα τον Πολυμένο, τον Υπεύθυνο του Εμμοδυναμικού Εργαστήριου της Βούλας, με βιωσιμότητα και απόφαση επαναγκύωση, ένα δύσκολο θέμα, την ιστορική θεώρηση σύγχρονη πράξη, και το δικό μας το Σωτήρι τον Τζαλαμανδρή, νόσο στελέχους νεότερα δεδομένα και βέλτιστα αντιμετώπιση. Και τη βραδιά θα τη συμπληρώσουν τρει εξαιρετικοί χειρουργοί, διευθυντέ, ο Κώστα ο Τριανταφύλλο από το Ιπποκράτιο, ο Γιώργο Σταυρίδη από το Ονάσιο και ο Γιώργο Σωμάκο από το Metropolitan Hospital. Άρα, επομένω, θα μάθουμε και θα διερευνήσουμε πολλέ πτυχέ τη Στεφανία Νόσου που εξακολουθεί να αποτελεί το μείζον πρόβλημα στην καθημερινή καρδιακή ιατρική. Απόψε η βραδιά. Είναι η Ιαν ιδιαίτερη, θα αναφερθώ αμέσως μετά, αφού προηγηθεί όμως η παρουσίαση μιας πολύ ενδιαφέρουσας περίπτωσης, της συνήθως περιπτώσει που παρουσιάζουμε κάθε τρίτη, από τον Βασίλη Τομάντζερ. Θα συνεχίσουμε στα αγγλικά και απόψε, επειδή οι προσκεκλημένοι μας θα μιλήσουν στα αγγλικά και για λόγους επικοινωνίας με αυτούς, ο Mr. Βασίλης Μάτζιαρης, Fellow of Cardiology in Hippocratio Hospital, will present very shortly an interesting case. Βασίλης. Good evening. I would like to thank Professor Tsiofis for his invitation to present an interesting case from our clinic. It's about a 56-year-old female with syncope palpitations. Uh, as you can appreciate from her ECG, there are T-wave inversion in the inferior uh, leads and frequent uh, ventricular ectopy beats. From her echo assessment, uh, which was consistent with her uh, personal history, we see moderate MR and posterior leaflet prolapse of mitral valve. Also, we see uh, atrial septal aneurysm. And uh, we had the question about MAD, which is the acronym of mitral annulus disjunction, uh, as you can see with the red arrow in this anatomical area. Uh, from her medical record, uh, pa the patient uh, had uh, one uh, polter monitoring with uh, 20,000 PVCs and uh, multiple episodes of non-sustained VT. So we decided to perform a coronary angiography and an EPS study, which both were negative. During her hospitalization, the patient had several episodes of non-sustained VT of short duration. So we considered the diagnosis of arrhythmic mitral valve prolapse, which is based in the presence of MVP in combination with frequent or complex ventricular ectopy in the absence of any other well-defined arrhythmic substrate. In order to understand better the mitral valve apparatus, we performed TOE, where you can see moderate MR and by leaflet prolapse of mitral valve. And uh, to complete our case, we performed CMR. Uh, here are still uh, images for better presentation. And we see enlargement of mitral uh, apparatus and mitral uh, annulus disjunction. Also, we see subepicardial fibrosis on the inferior uh, segment of left uh, wall uh, ventricular. Uh, having the diagnosis, uh, we question the further management of our patient based on the expert consensus, and we offered her an uh, ICD implantation because she has all the clinical and phenoty phenotypic uh, risk factors. Uh, So the take-home messages, uh, which are the take-home messages? 
uh, arrhythmic MVP is defined by mitral valve prolapse and frequent or complex ventricular ectopy. Holder monitoring should be performed in all patients with mitral valve prolapse. Also, cardiac MRI should be performed in patients with AMVP and risk factors, such in our patient uh, who had uh, syncope and non sustained MVP. And ICD plantation uh, should be considered in patients with clinical risk factors and high risk MVP morphology. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Vasilis, for this excellent uh, case. Uh, mitral valve prolapse is a very common disease. And the majority of those patients suffer and experience uh, extrasystole uh, um, with uh, this uh, feeling of palpitation. Not all in this patient with mitral valve uh, prolapse and uh, arrhythmias will uh, undergo an implantation of ACD, but for those few, very few patients, symptomatic patients with the history of syncope, as in our case, and with these compatible findings of MRI and um, compatible finds from uh, 24 hours ambulatory CG monitor, we can uh, provide, uh, we can recommend implantation of ACD. There are many, many unanswered questions in these um, in such cases, uh, how to differentiate and uh, how to select those patients who will undergo uh, ACD implantation and whether, uh, let's say, repair of uh, mitral valve prolapse could have any effect on the arrhythmic risk. But I think uh, this um, case is in line with what we will discuss maybe later with the first uh, presentation uh, by Stamatis Leratis, Imaging of Valvular Heart Disease. Maybe we'll have the opportunity to uh, Stamatis to comment on this uh, case. Thank you, Vasilis. And as I mentioned previously, uh, tonight I have the honor and the pleasure uh, to have uh, with us three uh, worldwide uh, experts uh, in uh, the specific topics of valvular disease. Uh, indeed, with the Cardiovascular Institute of Mount Sinai Medical Center from New York, you say, will share its experience with all of us. I would like to thank uh, Professor George Dangas uh, for uh, having the pleasure to, to be, uh, to respond positively and be with us uh, tonight. And along with George, we will have uh, Professor Stamatis uh, Lerakis and also Professor um, Roxana Mbran, uh, who is, let's say, great, great um, honor for us to have all uh, you, all of the, these, uh, let's say, experts tonight and to discuss very interesting uh, topics. Uh, uh, if it is, of course, uh, what I would suggest, George, first to have, uh, let's say, the lectures and then all together uh, to discuss um, uh, questions that uh, and comments that we will receive through chat, but of course that uh, also questions that each other would uh, ask. And again, many thanks for being with us. And um, I would like, let's say, just to say, George, you a few words, and then to introduce um, Stamatis. Uh, well, absolutely. Kalispera uh, Seolus, welcome to the um to these famous, uh, world famous Tuesday uh, lectures at the uh, uh, Hippocratic University Hospital, Department of Cardiology. Our pleasure to uh, have uh, this, uh, I would say, consortium of uh, professors from Mount Sinai to uh, address the aspects of valvular heart disease uh, for today. Each one is going to have a little different, uh, I would say, aspect. Uh, so not everybody's going to be talking about the same valve and about the same things all the time. Uh, more so, I have to say that we're very happy to be part in this uh, uh, organization with uh, uh, with the University of Athens, more so because my uh, uh, duties in the uh, Society of Cardiovascular and Geography and Interventions earlier this month did not allow me to be part of the uh, uh, Hellenic Cardiology Society Congress, which I always like to, uh, to come and be part of all the discussions. And actually, Professor Chufis was an esteemed past president of the Hellenic Cardiology Society. Uh, another aspect that maybe we discuss perhaps the next year, also a worldwide expert is though with Professor Chufis is the, hype, the innervation for resistant hypertension. But we hear that there may be a subject that um, may be approval in the United States of new, new uh, devices and maybe new devices in Europe after uh, spring 2023. So perhaps that might be a very fruitful discussion um, uh, later on. 
so um, without any further delay from my part, I'd like to introduce the director of the uh, um, uh, non-invasive cardiology of the Mount Sinai Health System and an expert in the uh, interventional echocardiography, interventional procedures guided by CT, MR, and echo imaging, uh, Stamadios Lerakis, who is uh, uh, also in the faculty of the uh, University of Athens uh, uh, School of Medicine, uh, and uh, uh, came to join Mount Sinai a few years ago after having a tremendous career at the Emory University Medical Center in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, Dr. Rakis uh, is, a, is, a, is a proud Greek. Um, I, I, you know, he's from the, uh, uh, his uh, father actually was a, a, a resident of Astoria in New York, uh, which I knew him very well. And he, I'm sure he's very happy from many aspects to be part of the faculty of Mount Sinai and also very, very happy to know that uh, Dr. Arakis has also become an archon in a, in a Greek Orthodox church very recently. So from all these aspects, I'd like to introduce Professor Arakis to kick off and talk to us about non-invasive aspects of valvular heart disease. Uh, uh, Kalispera, Kalispera Solus. Uh, thank you, George, for uh, this kind introduction. I would like to thank also Professor uh, Chufis for uh, this kind of invitation. It's really an honor to be here, and especially it's a special honor to be in the same panel with Professor uh, Meran and uh, Professor Dangas. Um, also, giving this talk, as uh, George said earlier, reminds me the time that I was a medical student in my fourth year of medical school. Uh, being in the amphitheater of uh, Hippocratic Hospital and listening to these lectures at that time with uh, uh, Professor, I mean, Professor Kiro uh, Kiro uh, Pablo Tutuza. Um, so it's a great pleasure to uh, be part of this. And again, thank you, George, for organizing. I will, uh, I decided to talk about uh, all imaging for TAVI because uh, of, the, of the time constraints. And uh, because all these procedures, as you know, are very delicate, and uh, so I prefer to talk about uh, one procedure, and maybe in the future we can talk about uh, other procedures as well. So uh, we have two devices that we use for uh, uh, the TAVI. Uh, the one is the, the self-expanding valve, uh, which is a different profile, a long uh, valve. And as you can see here, especially for the students, uh, the landmark is the, um, the pictal catheter, which is in the, um, down into the annulus. And that's the, uh, that's the landmark that uh, we follow in order to decide where to position the valve and deploy the valve, as you can see uh, on the other images. And this is the balloon expandable uh, valve. Uh, again, uh, the pictal is there. And at this time, um, actually, the valves have evolved. Uh, in the beginning, where we start to do to use this valve in the partner trial, this sign, this marker on the middle of the valve was not present. Uh, but now, uh, what we do, we align the pixel with this marker, and that's where uh, we deploy uh, the valve under uh, rapid uh, pacing uh, for this particular valve. And uh, all of us who do these procedures know that our Mary. Um, tables uh, about the sizes and also what uh, the T will show or the CT will show and the measures, measurements to follow in order to decide what size of the valve we use, either if it's balloon uh, expandable or self-expandable uh, prosthesis. Uh, the aortic root, uh, which uh, is, uh, has the aortic annulus, the commissus, the sinus of alsava, the subtubular junction, the aortic leaflets and the ostea of the coronary arteries, which basically we call the landing zone, is a very complex structure and a very important structure to image in order to have a good uh, procedure. And all of us who do this procedure are familiar with the aortic root, uh, with this cartoon, which basically shows the annulus uh, on green, which basically is the virtual ring formed by the joining vessel attachments of the aortic valve leaflets. And uh, because it's virtual, that's why it's difficult uh, to visualize 
and difficult to image, but very critical for the success of the procedure. Uh, just because uh, I was involved with this from the beginning of the uh, TAVI procedure, and just to give some uh, historic perspective, this is a patient, uh, a transthoracic echo, and you measure the annulus here, and it's 1.8 centimeters. The same patient, this is the same patient, a transophageal echo, and you measure the annulus, and the annulus is 2 centimeters. So which is correct, 1.8 or 2 centimeters? Very important uh, if you come to decide what size of valve you will use. And also, this is a study that we did in Emory uh, in the beginning of the partner trial. If you take the same patient into the operating room to have a aortic valve replacement and measure the annulus with the surgical clips, you will see that the, actually the annulus is even larger than what you measure with the T and the transthoracic echo. Why is that? The answer to this question is uh, it came with the development of CT, which basically now is the cold standard for this kind of procedures. Uh, today, all the patients who undergo TAVI, they have to undergo CT uh, only in a few cases like a renal. If there's problems with renal function, you may not do a CT, you may do an MRI or do a transophageal echo, but almost all the cases the undergo um, CT, and by CT, it's very clear that the annulus is not circular, but an oval structure that has a major and minor diameter, as you can see in these images. Very important things to follow when you image the aortic valve, as you can see in this case, to see how bulky the aortic valve is, to see the, the calcifications, the location of the calcifications, very important to determine how risk this procedure will be uh, for the development of a stroke, one of the uh, major complications uh, of uh, the TAVI uh, procedure. And we know today we have a Sentinel Cerebral Protected Protection Devices. Sentinel is one of those. There are many others. And there are trials that uh, have been done as recently as we published in the TCT, which shows mid not very protective results, but still we use it when uh, when we think it's appropriate uh, to be used. Also, transophageal echo we use to measure, as I told you, the minor and major diameter of the aortic annulus, the perimeter. And uh, today, as I told you before, it's easier to do with a CT, but also in the cases that you don't, you cannot do a CT for the reasons that I said before, you can do this. Uh, measurements with a transophageal echo using 3D transophageal echo. As you can see in this case, where the patient had the transophageal echo and a CT, and you can see that the numbers for the area of the annulus as well as the perimeter are almost identical. So in good hands, uh, you can perform uh, the same measurements with both transophageal echo and CT. And I think uh, the fellows uh, in cardiology and also uh, they should learn to perform all this uh, uh, as much as possible. And the aortic annulus size is very important because deciding the correct size will make prevent the complications. And one of the complications is uh, uh, paravalvular leak. And as you can see in this study that was performed in 2014, uh, if you compare 3D TE measurements with the measurements by CT, it's almost the same. Uh, for the prediction of which patient will have paravalvular regurgitation. Also, what about if you have a case that you measure that is in the middle? Let's say the annulus comes to 22. What valve you will use? You will use a 26 in this case or a 29. In this case, you can use uh, a balloon. As you can see there, a 23 millimeter balloon uh, was used and uh, inflate the balloon so you can obstruct make sure you obstruct no backflow. So the, that means that the balloon is obstructing the annulus completely. You can use a 3D a transophageal echo. You can measure the size of the balloon, as you can see in this case, measures 25. So you will use a larger valve, 29 instead of 26. So there are many ways today to measure uh, the annulus, both before the procedure 
but also during the procedure today because of the advancement in CCT, most of these measurements are very accurate and uh, you don't have to do much during the procedure. Also, the calcifications of the valve and the distribution of the calcifications are very important to know. And of course, today with the CT, you know the calcifications, you can see the calcifications much easier. But calcifications are also very important to determine the severity of aortic stenosis. The more calcium you have, the more likely the stenosis will be more severe. And this is especially important for the low flow aortic stenosis. As you know, uh, before we used to do a lot of the vitamins uh, to see if there is any increase in velocity with the use of a low, low dose dobutamine. But today we went away from that. And uh, because all the patients have CT, we do measurement of the calcium of the aortic valve. And uh, we know that the, the calcium in the, in the men is more than the women. And uh, if uh, the calcium score is high, then the possibility that the stenosis is true uh, stenosis and not pseudostenosis is more likely. And to this point, uh, we know that the, um, the valves the, in men is more calcified compared to women where the stenosis appears to be more because of fibrosis of the leaflets. So more fibrosis, fibrotic stenosis on the uh, women and the more calcific stenosis on men. Other parameters that we follow, LVOT landing zone. Look at this patient. Severe calcification of the sub subaortic uh, location. As you can see, uh, severe matter annular calcification, uh, severe annular calcification. Very important to know in this particular case because you should decide which value you use. Or most likely on this case, you use a self-expanding valve because you have less uh, less uh, less pressure on the on the aorta and less likelihood that you will cause rupture of the of the annulus. Also, look at this proximal bulge. Uh, this you should know. And many times, for these reasons, we we'll do uh, ablation before we do ablation, alcohol ablation of the proximal septum in order to prevent embolization of the valve. Uh, sometimes of the new valve. Also, uh, you should know the ejection fraction because when you use rapid pacing, this can make the function more worst and can be more problematic and you have problems for the patient to recover. So if you have a low ejection fraction, most likely you don't want to use rapid pacing. So you will use, you prefer to use most likely a self-expanding valve. Also the presence of aortic regurgitation if you start with significant aortic regurgitation, sometimes uh, when the stenosis is severe, we do balloon valvuloplasty in order to make for the valve easier to go and place it. So if you have significant AI to start with, you will consider not if you to try to avoid the BAV, the balloon valvuloplasty, uh, in order to prevent worsening of the AI and the compensation of the patient. So everything uh, is very important and everything is very important to screen before the procedure and know exactly what is happening. This is uh, use of T uh, for T for uh, measuring the the height of the coronary arteries. Very important to know before the procedure. But of course, today it's easier to do that with uh, with a CT, and that's what uh, is the gold standard uh, today. Also the the size of the leaflet can be very important because if the size of the aortic leaflet is is uh, longer than the distance between the annulus and the ostium of the coronary artery, this can cause also significant problems during valve uh, deployment. Uh, this is a paper long time ago about the practical guide of multimodality imaging for transcarter valve replacement. And uh, moving on to the guide, the position and deployment of the valve. Coaxial alignment is very important, actually critical uh, for, for uh, the success of the procedure. As you can see on the uh, left upper slide and no coaxial uh, position and on the right lower a coaxial position. That's what you want to see uh, at least by echo, transophageal echo uh, before you deploy uh, the valve. And just for the interest of time, very important imaging very important during the procedure to detect 
uh, complications. Uh, you don't want to see the valve in the ventricle. This actually was a case uh, early, in the early experience of the, as you can see, the catheter comes from the LV apex. This was a transapical approach uh, to deploy the valve, which now is uh, abandoned. But uh, this can happen also with uh, a transfemoral approach or any other approach that you try to develop the valve. This is uh, also very important. Every step of the way, very critical for the success of the procedure. If you can see here what happens, the pacemaker was not stabilized well. This, again, is early experience in the beginning. And as you can see, there is, during the rapid pacing, there was an extra PVC that happened that throw the valve, uh, embolized the valve into the aorta. And this was able to uh, move the valve then and bring it into the descending aorta where it was deployed and another valve was placed. Aortic regurgitation, valvular or paravalvular, very important uh, for this procedure uh, to detect. And, uh, and uh, this is because we know that even a mild paravalvular leak is, uh, can cause a lot of problems uh, uh, to the patient. So today, I uh, would not allow the patient to come out of the operating room with the more than trivial, uh, if possible, non uh, paravalvular regurgitation. So this is uh, an actual case, as you can see here, uh, always for the uh, trainees and the fellows who do this, uh, always very important to get deep gastric images and evaluate the aortic valve uh, after the valve is deployed in the deep esophageal images, uh, because that's the best view uh, to get and see the paravalvular regurgitation in the mid esophageal views, you may miss it. This is a severe aortic regurgitation, valvular aortic regurgitation. And this is, you can see closer, you can appreciate that there is overhanging native leaflets. Uh, the leaflets were too long and they were not, the valve was not positioned to cover the native leaflets. So in this case, another valve was placed more aortic uh, and uh, uh, was able to solve uh, the problem. Many guidelines today. Uh, for how to measure the paravalvular regurgitation with MR, uh, matter, with uh, CMR, with echo, transophageal echo. Uh, and uh, I will show you a case. This is uh, after the valve, the valve was uh, 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 placed uh, a few months uh, uh, ago before this uh, transophageal echo was performed. As you can see, significant uh, uh, paravalvular regurgitation, uh, but uh, they wanted to do more evaluation to quantify the paravalvular regurgitation better. And in these particular cases, uh, we use MRI, and I think it's a, a good technique to use, especially if there's a difference between the what you see with the echo or TE and the symptoms of the patient. If you want to get an accurate uh, measurement, uh, uh, a cardiac MRI uh, should be considered and it's very easy to be done with face contrast imaging. As you can see, you get the forward volume and the backwards volume. In this particular case, the regurgitant fraction was 39 percent. And there are many studies today to show that uh, uh, if you have a more than moderate to severe uh, PVL, um, then the prognosis of the patient is bad. So you have to do something to try to fix it. The good news is that uh, because of the technology, advancements uh, and the inner outer skirts uh, too many skirts on the valves the paravalvular regurgitation is not as big problem today as was uh, early when the, these valves um, when we started to do these uh, valves uh, about 10 years ago and uh, how to treat this paravalvular regurgitation usually uh, one of the techniques is uh, post balloon dilatation as you can see here uh, on the left upper, you have significant PVL, and after two balloon dilatations, uh, the PVL uh, is gone. This is one way uh, to treat uh, these valves, and that's what we try to do, especially if this uh, PVL happens uh, on the table uh, uh, before the patient uh, goes, leaves the cath lab. Another important complication uh, that uh, always we worry, especially if you have a lot of calcification in the annulus, uh, and in the LVOT is a uh, rupture when you, and that's why it's very important before we do the procedure to 
and do careful evaluation with ECHO and we do always to make sure that there is no pericardial effusion uh, to know that from the beginning because after the procedure if you start seeing if you start seeing pericardial effusion then something went uh, really wrong uh, this is uh, an actual case uh, here as you can see the as by minutes seconds passing the pericardial effusion was getting larger as you can see off axis view you get the feeling that there is something going on in the aortic root aortic annulus this uh, rupture of the aortic root and you can see immediately a T probe was placed and uh, here uh, you cannot miss this this uh, rupture uh, of the aorta one uh, uh, critical complication this is uh, uh, we start doing now by caspid valves and uh, by caspid valves are usually associated with uh, aneurysms um, and uh, we do this only in special uh, uh, high risk as uh, was this uh, particular patient and after the valve was deployed, uh, we tried, I tried to go uh, to see if there was any PVL. And when I came up, uh, there was a big dissection. So uh, this is a different topic uh, by caspid valve and aortic uh, aneurysms, a different topic. Also, another uh, possible complication is obstruction of the coronaries. Uh, you should be able to look at the coronary ostia with a TE uh, for the imagers uh, during the procedure. Uh, this is uh, after the TAVI, and today, because of the uh, improvements in technology, you can actually measure the coronary flow. Uh, there's a pattern that you push on the echo machine in the TE for coronary flow, and you can see actually and measure coronary flow uh, on the patients. Again, this is another article. Uh, 34 years since the original idea, uh, where it took a story four years to move from uh, the left up, the significant stenotic valve, Balloon vapuloplasty on the right tap, uh, valve deployment uh, on the bottom left, and the wide open aortic valve uh, on the right lower without to have to open the chest. A tremendous uh, technological and medical uh, life saving uh, procedure for many of our patients. Also, uh, today we do a lot of uh, valve in valve procedures uh, for patients who have a bioprosthetic valve, and since particular case, Severely stenotic valve uh, with some aortic regurgitation uh, doesn't have to open. You don't have to open the chest anymore, as you can see here. A very beautiful image of cracking the valve. Some of the valves, uh, bioprosthetic valves, can be cracked, as in this particular case, to make the valve area uh, larger. Uh, you can see it on the the cracking on the on this image, and uh, the valve is placed mild AI, central AI from the catheter. After the catheter is pulled out, no AI and the beautiful coronary flow uh, with no obstruction of coronary flow. And moving uh, to the last part, one more minute, a uh, patient with abnormal, uh, because now we are doing this for, for uh, many years, most like more than 10 years. Now we'll start seeing the generation of these valves. Uh, and that's uh, um, <clears throat> one issue that's coming up. This is a case that we did uh, about a week ago. Uh, a patient uh, had a 26 balloon expandable valve a few years back, comes back with symptoms again. As you can see, the leaflets are thickened, decreased mobility of the leaflets. This is a deep gastric view, minimal AI, and uh, some parabarbural regurgitation, but definitely uh, decreased mobility of the leaflets. And in this particular case, another valve was placed in 29 millimeter self-expanding valve uh, was placed to solve the problem. So we we'll start doing, seeing this uh, more frequently now since uh, these valves now, especially the ones that had the, are becoming five, more than five years old. Uh, so we'll begin to start to see that in this particular case, after the valve was placed, no AI wide open leaflets. Moving on, because I know Professor Dangas will talk about the thrombosis of TAVI, and I want to give him some images for that. Uh, this is, uh, as you can see here, you cannot miss this transcranial echo of a uh, sepient valve with uh, uh, thrombosed leaflets. You can see the thrombus on the leaflets. Um, and uh, of course, what we see with uh, um, the CT, the HALT, uh, hypotenusion leaflet thickening, uh, but also can be seen very nicely uh, with the transcranial echo. And this was uh, the gradient up, up, up about four. Uh, meters per second um, before anticoagulation and uh, 
uh, after three months of anticoagulation, and Dr. Professor Dangas will talk about uh, this, uh, the velocity came down uh, to about two uh, meters per second. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, really, it's an honor and a great pleasure uh, to have the opportunity to present uh, to, this, uh, to this forum. Thank you again. Thank you, Stamatis, for this great talk. Thank you for providing so many information about the correct, the appropriate imaging before the table procedure. Uh, I, we will have a discussion in the end, but uh, let me ask in a short question. You highlighted the importance of uh, CT before TAVI procedure. And now uh, CT is a must before any TAVI intervention. But do you think, Stamatis, that the interventionalist who will do the TAVI procedure should be also very familiar with the analyzing of the CT imaging in order to also to have personal uh, view on the selection of the appropriate size of the valve and also for design the, the strategy of the procedures? And the second comment, uh, this is not the case for doing CT if or when a patient should undergo a surgical replacement of the aortic valve. And we see, unfortunately, not uh, very rare, some cases with mismatch between the size of the aortic valve and the aortic annulus after the surgical uh, correction. Do you think that also CT should be performed in any patients before, uh, before aortic replacement, either uh, transcutaneous or uh, surgically? Yes, uh, again, thank you, Professor Chufis, for the invitation. Um, uh, great questions. Uh, I think, you know, and actually here in, uh, in Mount Sinai and also in Emory, where I was before, um, the interventional cardiologist and the surgeons were very familiar. Uh, actually, the analysis uh, using 3 and uh, maybe you have other software increased, but uh, here we use 3 the same in Emory. Uh, the interventional cardiologist and, uh, and the surgeon also does his own analysis. Uh, he, using the CT that is performed, he put it on the Thrimensio and uh, you do the measurements, uh, all the things that I talk about, the annulus, the perimeter, the area, the height of the... So I think it's very important. And actually, here in, uh, and in, and in Emory and now in Mount Sinai, uh, the people who read the CTs, um, they don't do report, they do, they do not report on the measurements. Uh, for the TAVI, because we do this because uh, we do it again anyway. The interventional cardiologists, they, we do, they do it again. So uh, in order to save them time, uh, we don't do, but I, I agree 100%. The interventional, the interventional cardiologist should be able to do this by himself or herself um, uh, because it's very critical. I mean, the, and in the beginning, you know, it takes some time, but uh, the more you do, the faster you are, able, you are able to do, but definitely uh, has to be done by the person who does the procedure. Uh, uh, so to also be responsible for the for what happens, you know. So I think it's very important. Now regarding the size of the um, of the surgery of the surgical AVRs, um, I mean, you know, this uh, I think nothing can beat life uh, measurements. You know, if you have the aortic valve in front of you in the operating room i think uh, uh, as i show you uh, that's the best uh, um, way to measure the annulus uh, uh, i mean i don't know ct you know if uh, offer any more can offer any more information than having uh, the valve uh, right in front of you to measure uh, everything you need and uh, so that, that's my opinion professor chuvis yeah Thank you, Stamatis. If you, Stamatis, agree at George, let's move on to the next presentation and we will have uh, more time for questions in the end. It's my great pleasure now to introduce Professor George Dagas uh, to deliver his talk about thrombosis of TAVI. Uh, I don't think that uh, is there any reason to say more about uh, George. Just to say that now George is uh, the director of the Cardiovascular Innovation Center at the center and Michael Venner at the Mount Sinai Hospital. It is, there is no meeting, there is no great uh, clinical trial where George not to be there 
and discuss with the world other experts in different aspects of interventional cardiology. George, the virtual floor is yours. Great, excellent. I hope you are, uh, all see the, the slide set. And uh, please open it. Okay. Excellent, excellent, George. Um, in the slideshow. Uh, great, there's a great system, and uh, always my pleasure to uh, expand our uh, teachings and our collaborations with the University of Athens in many aspects of research and education. And uh, we're gonna, I want to carry on on what uh, Stam said about antithrombotic therapy after TAVI and tell you a little bit about where we started from. We started from knowing not too much, but understanding that there were patient and valve factors listed here and grouped in some ways, and also understanding that we have a, an array of antiplatelets and anticoagulants already available to us, and see how we could possibly mix them and, and combine them, and possibly also understand this disease in the context of other cardiovascular diseases that we had, such as the coronary stents, the aortic stents, the aneurysm stents perhaps, uh, or valvuloplasties, or other aspects of cardiovascular disease of this part. And then it came what this new phenomenon, due to this tremendous imaging, and Stam showed you the top, and just in case you missed it, we have this great classification right below that makes more sense. And essentially, it's just a cup, a cup of coffee, one must say, um, and perhaps great coffee, I don't know, but uh, something similar. And, you know, you pour a little bit in there, and slowly it kind of fills up. And it fills all the way up. It's grade four. And obviously this uh, cusp doesn't move because it's stuck. It's stuck by this dark blue material. Uh, and the more it is and the more uh, strong it becomes, the less mobile this leaflet becomes. If you have more than one leaflet, you're going to have severe stenosis, and perhaps in many aspects, you may also have severe regurgitation. So that's not really great. The trouble comes when you have grade one, or what exactly does grade two mean? Or where does it really fit? So the guidelines were empirical for the most part. Those are 2020, 2017 European guidelines, 2020 American guidelines, very empirical, a lot of C's, level of evidence C, expert opinion. Then 2021 guidelines in European society being informed by a few trials indicating that less is more and not try to do too much in all TAVI patients, try to do something that makes more sense selectively. Why do they say that? First of all, talking about valve trials, we're talking in the thousands. You're talking about drug trials in valve disease, you're talking in the hundreds. In any other disease, it's quite the opposite. You're talking about drug trials, in the many thousands, and you're talking about device trials in the several hundreds. So clearly, whatever we know, whatever we think we know, in, uh, in, in valve disease and anticoagulation, it's really based on a series of pilot trials. That's all these trials are. This is the largest, one of the largest, actually the largest dedicated trial, and you can see that it only has about 110 patients per group. Great design, low number. It was stopped due to futility. Not, not that many people like to be enrolled in the study. Uh, it is not a strictly post study, as the clopidogrel arm compares aspirin to aspirin plus clopidogrel. The clopidogrel arm, for the most part, was delivered before the procedure, very much as a loading dose, as a chronic loading. So it doesn't exactly tell you what happens afterwards. It includes a lot of bleeding periprocedurally, and there's no question that you see on the left side, there's a lot of activity early on with a, a dual antiplatelet therapy. Most interestingly, though, it's the first trial that showed that the stroke, or at least the major stroke, or the apparent stroke, didn't have much to do with the anti with avoiding clopidogrel. They didn't seem to have more strokes with clopidogrel. Well, small numbers, of course, but trends were were positive. Then we tried the Galileo study, a combination of maybe an anticoagulant, a low dose. We got the low dose right, but the anticoagulant didn't seem to work. I'll tell you why. But anyhow, this is the 
this is the uh, this is the, the project uh, rivaroxaban just 10 milligram in 15 to 20 is used daily for retro fibrillation so clearly we're doing intermediate dose of rivaroxaban there is an even smaller dose 2.5 bi twice a day though that's nearly equivalent to seven and a half or eight milligrams daily so not much difference a little smaller but just a little smaller because you give it twice a day so you accumulate the drug quite a bit more anyhow we combine with low dose aspirin for three months and comparing with dual antiplatelet therapy and afterwards this monotherapy of the rivaroxaban versus the aspirin on the right side there was a trend towards higher bleeding that was expected nothing different than what was expected on the left side was a surprise a lot of mortality driving the overall endpoint of um, MACE unfavorably, particularly beyond one year. And you can see, particularly in the long run, there was significant disparity on the left side, the MACE events. You can see the definition of MACE right there, all sorts of thrombotic events we included. Interestingly, what, this is what I said, that perhaps the anticoagulant didn't help much, or maybe the combination didn't help much, but the dose was right, because ultimately, what we really started with was that to prevent the halt, this clotting I was showing you on the valves. And turns out that even the low dose of rivaroxaban did a tremendous job preventing this clots in 11% down to just 2% for important clots, grade 3 or 4. And the leaflet thickening from 30% down to 12%. So interestingly, the study was criticized for the opposite reasons in the beginning. It was criticized that the dose was too low and that we, there would be no efficacy in preventing the blood clots without the full dose anticoagulation. So little we knew way back then. So low dose does the job. Don't give it indiscriminately to everybody uh, because you are going to have other sorts of unfavorable adverse events is the outcome of this study. That was the first one that was over a thousand patients in heart valve disease and that. The, 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 uh, an, an innovative design comes out of the, of the Dutch group in Holland, the popular TAVI. And they tried clopidogrel versus no clopidogrel in population without or with anti oral anticoagulation. So they studied every patient that kind of divided them into cohorts. Um, monotherapy of either aspirin or oral anticoagulation was a control group. Interestingly, again, the study, like ART, did not start exclusively after TAVI, included all these drugs been randomized and given before the procedure for the most part. So Galileo, the only study thus far that clearly started a few days after TAVI, so up on this chart, which I think this is when we decide. You, wanna, you don't decide before the procedure what you want to do after the patient goes home. You decide when the patient goes home after the procedure what you want to send the patient home at. So nonetheless, don't forget that there's going to be a lot of bleeding here because everybody's getting all these drugs ahead of time, ahead of the invasive procedure. Clopidogrel, bleeding noise up top early on on the left side, not a lot of difference afterwards. So a lot related with loading dose. The, um, on the right side, the aspirin group seems to catch up. Uh, up to a year. Interestingly, the study has a first innovative design here, 30-day treatment, one year follow-up. So beyond 30 days, beyond, beyond, excuse me, 90-day treatment, beyond 90 days, beyond three months, everybody was sort of on aspirin. So despite that, it seems that aspirin clopidogrel felt better between 90 days and one year here, a trend, a trend of a new finding or a trend of a chance, we won't know until another study has a similar design. The bleeding comes here, what I told you. From the get-go, you can see on the left side, 10% of bleeding on the control group, major bleeding on day one, right away, boom, you see the blue line. And the people who have clopidogrel as well, boom, right away starting with 20%. This is a lot of bleeding, no question about that. Remember what I told you in the beginning. All these studies started these drugs before the procedure, something we don't do indiscriminately in any other center, I don't think. Atlantis trial uh, went back to a Galileo type of design, studying patients after the TAVI, try to configure what we're going to do with or without AFib uh, in this population, a different control, 
but they had an innovative design, the sim single full dose anticoagulation as the investigational arm in either cohort. So if you if you need a Coumadin, you, you may be randomized to Coumadin versus the Eliquis, or if you need the aspirin or the dual antiplatelet, you're gonna be randomized to that, to antiplatelet versus again, the Eliquis five twice a day, full dose apixaban. Uh, overall in the anticoagulation, you just have about 200 patients per group, not a lot, not a lot of people again. In the no anticoagulation, there are some differences before they weren't, there are some differences, but again, the difference is not so favorable. Uh, again, higher mortality, non-cardiac mortality, and all the signals we saw from Galileo, pretty much well repeated. Very clear. There's a minor decrease in stent thrombosis, in the valve thrombosis that you see on the bottom, which is an imaging endpoint. Um, the overall imaging substudy in the first line, not significant between control and treatment. However, this is due to the interaction, pretty obvious. There was a major benefit in decreasing the valve clots with the anticoagulation versus antiplatelet in the stratum one, but no difference in stratum two, although somehow that, that stratum two fared unfavorably. You see nine and a half percent valve thrombosis with the apixaban versus only 5.5 percent with the warfarin. It's a non-significant, but not the way that I'd like to see it going. But a lot of large study, over a thousand patients, the 1,400 patients here in the endoxaban and, and, and versus vitamin K study in the envisage. We're happy to publish it just a week after the European Society guidelines. Uh, you can see the asterisks explaining uh, the dose reduction for endoxaban to go down to 30 milligrams instead of 60 due to low body weight or due to renal failure, or the, the way we adjust uh, vitamin K with a double asterisk, a triple asterisk. Which of the people, about 50%, who ended up having um, um, antiplatelet therapy concomitant? So, about half of the people did get that due to pretty much a, a recent stent of some sort. Overall, the study was positive, showing non inferiority of the new regimen. You can see the NACE, which is MACE or major bleeding, uh, pretty much on top of each other, the lines very clear at two years. On the other hand, particularly beyond a year, there seemed to be a signal for a major bleeding uh, against the adoxaban and favoring vitamin K. So we've got to be a little careful about that. Let's look into further into that. You see that the when the adoxaban dose was 30, the differences in bleeding weren't just there. You can see that in the in the second uh, in the second bar graph from the top, second row. And similarly, there was less uh, um, less uh, um, bleedings with the specified oral antiplatelet therapy was not specified. So the specified antiplatelet produced more bleeding and the high dose of adoxaban produced more of the bleeding. We're doing further analysis right now when I have some results presented in London Dow regarding the predictions of mortality and predictions of bleeding. Prediction of bleeding probably going to be at Euro PCR 2023 in order to inform more people about exactly how these predictions of the stratification going. Because in my mind, the doctors need a lot of help. When we tell them in the end of this conclusion, they're gonna have to, uh, they're gonna have to, I would say, um, 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 uh, individualize the care. Well, they need to know how to do it. And the more analysis we do and the more stratification tools we provide, the better it is. So the five, uh, take home messages in my mind is that the even low dose of the anticoagulation is effective against the valve thrombosis. When we need oral anticoagulation, a monotherapy is, very, is, is more preferable than the combination. And there is no role to start anticoagulation indiscriminately for no good reason on any one of these patients. Uh, the clopidogrel loading, not, not needed. And I don't think anybody's practicing that. The uh, interesting thing again, six years ago, we published a secondary analysis of the Bravo 3 trial suggesting that clopidogrel may not, may, may loading may be associated with neurovascular complications. We, can't, we couldn't get that patient published anywhere because everybody was rejecting it as an analysis that makes no sense. And why would the clopidogrel have all this bleeding and, and vascular complications problems? Just to see how the tide changes. 
uh, over the over the time. Now, based on randomized trials, the clopidogrel loading is out. Uh, the and and the prolonged anticoagulant combination therapies for any patient they need to be avoided as much as possible or reaffirmed at every visit if that is followed. Okay, so if you're sending someone out in a combination, that's got to be a term, and you have to reassess and how did the patient do? There's any side effects? There's still a need to continue. Then only you continue. Thank you for your attention, and we go back to the panel and perhaps some questions in the end. Thank you. Thank and you. Don't, don't forget to sign up for Sky as members and fellows, all of you who uh, who are uh, qualified. That would be great. Thank you, George. Really a very, very nice uh, talk, providing all this data. As you correctly mentioned, we need more data, and unfortunately, it's difficult to obtain more data about the correct, the appropriate and the thrombotic therapy in those patients with um, such device. Um, uh, while we have some questions in, uh, in the chat, uh, let me introduce uh, George, the last uh, speaker, and then having a discussion in the end. It's really a great, great uh, pleasure and honor for me. And also, it's an honor for all the, let's say, participants in this uh, uh, Tuesday lessons of the Hippocratic Hospital to have uh, tonight with us Professor Roxana Meran. Uh, Professor Roxana Meran is Professor of Medicine and the Director of Interventional Cardiovascular Research at Clinical Trials at the Zena and Michael Weiner Cardiovascular Institute and the Mount Sinai Medical Center in New York. But everyone, there is no interventional cardiologist, there is no cardiologist in, the, in all the world not to know and not to enjoy the talks that um, Roxana delivered in any major cardi uh, cardiology meeting. There is no innovation, there is no new drug uh, therapy or new device without being uh, Roxana behind it. Really, thank you, Roxana, for being with us. And we will uh, looking forward to enjoying your talk, Tavin Females and Small Aortic Annulus. Your... Thank you. Thank you so much. Ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ. Καλησπέρα σας, Professor Zipus and uh, all of my colleagues in Greece. I wish that I was there right at the Hippocratian Hospital in the most beautiful city of the world that I enjoy spending time with friends and family. It is a, a wonderful uh, opportunity to talk to you guys about TAVI in small annuli. Uh, important for you to note my disclosures for the institution and the academic research organization that I run here at Mount Sinai with multiple device and drug manufacturers who um, fund the research that goes on here. What is a small annulus? Have you ever thought about that? I think we think, oh, it's just a certain size. The truth is there's no real definition. Nothing standardized. There've been some proposed definitions, an annulus in which a surgical prosthesis of greater than 21 millimeters can't fit. That's a terrible definition, wouldn't you agree? Significant variability on how surgical prosthesis size is labeled. Or maybe a little bit more interesting is an annular diameter less than or equal to 23 millimeters. The fact of the matter is that as we move forward, as we are treating older, sicker patients, as well as those who have comorbid conditions, we're going to see a smaller annular in their aortic position. And of course, these are the same patients who are at a very high surgical risk. So the truth is we in the TAVI arena have to deal with this a lot better. And since TAVR for the last 20 years, I think we're all doing much, much better measurements than our surgical colleagues did in the past. And the fact is, that small annuli are common. If you were to look at that original um, uh, uh, definition of less than 21 millimeters, it's about 40% or so. And if we look at the TAVI prosthesis, we see it somewhere in 30, 25 to 
We see it more commonly in Southern Europe and Asia, especially in those patients who have TAV and SAV. And the prevalence is extremely high in women. 90% of the small annulus population are women. We did a study on only women in the multi-center observational trial that we had called WIN-TAVI. And there, a small annulus implanted less than 23 millimeters was up there for 42% of the female populations undergoing TAVI. But it is really important not to think about the pink and the blue colors, but rather the pathobiology and the pathophysiology of aortic stenosis as it relates to sex and gender, or sex really, it's the biologic differential. Women have less calcification, interestingly, higher fibrosis score, smaller annulus and a lower coronary height, and they get concentric remodeling. Whereas men have more calcification, less lower fibrosis uh, score, larger annulus, higher coronary height, and concentric and eccentric hypertrophy in response to aortic stenosis. Now, you may look at that in the same hemodynamic severity of aortic stenosis, and we will conclude that women are not just small men, that there is actually differences in the pathobiology and in the biology as we are looking at this. These important gender or sex differences in aortic root anatomy have been well documented. In fact, female sex is associated with the smallest, smaller annular and LVOT, but very similar aortic dimensions, which is interesting. If we look and you would imagine that maybe they would even have smaller aortas, but it really is about the annulus and the left ventricular outflow tract for women. What are the recommendations, the ACC AHA guidelines for the management of patients of valvular heart disease? You're getting a favor, favorable result for SAVR in, of course, bicuspid aortic valve, subaortic um, LV outflow calcification, rheumatic valve disease, and even in small or large annulus annuli. What we're seeing in TAVI for aortic stenosis is calcific aortic stenosis of tri-leaflet. Why is that? I think it's because in the past, the surgical enlargement of a small annulus would allow for the use of a larger prosthesis to minimize that patient prosthesis mismatch. But the fact is that recent studies are showing us that TAVI is a very viable alternative. And in fact, if you look at the outcomes of small annulus and small aortic root undergoing surgical aortic valve, and small, what I mean by that is an inner aortic sinotubular diameter indexed for the height of less than 1.4 centimeters per meter squared in women and less than 1.5 centimeters per meter squared in men. And if you look there, you could see that the combined endpoints are looking much, much worse for small aortic root, whether it's a, a combined MI, PCI, unstable angina, cabbage, non-hemorrhagic stroke, or cardiovascular death, or even just non-hemorrhagic stroke, worse for the small annulus. But in TAVR, on the other hand, or TAVI, Annular size is not a predictor of death. In an IPD analysis of over 11,000 patients, the predictor of all-cause mortality, annular size did not come out. In fact, but since women were there, they actually had a better result. They were, it was the, the, the in the both multivariate and univariate, they had a 20% less chance of mortality. So in fact, women had a better survival after TAVI. And remember that women mostly have a small annular size. Remember also that the hemodynamics in a small annulus is usually better after a TAVI compared to a 
surgical aortic valve replacement. And it's probably the fact that we oversize and also we don't have that sewing cuff. So there's a larger diameter. In fact, in our wind heavy registry, we did look at the small valve substudy and we tried to look at the um, uh, safety and performance of TAVI in women. We had 1,019 women in that TAVI registry, most of them high risk. This We use the size to look at the small versus the non-small annulus. And we didn't show any differences in the major outcomes according to the VARC2 definitions for death, death, stroke, hospitalization, according to the valve size. The valve size had no significant impact on the efficacy or outcomes of TAVI in women. And if we actually look at the results over time, TAVI in a non-small versus a small um, valve, TAVI led to a significant improvement in symptoms at six and 12 months, irrespective of the valve size. So the valve size kind of goes away. Now remember, these are all women. What about the type of valve? Which one would be better? There was the choice trial and the choice extended registry, all of them looking at the small annulus. They, they use that mean um, uh, annular diameter of less than 23 millimeters. And they showed that the self-expanding valves had less valvular regurgitation than balloon expandable valves, especially in those patients with a small annulus. Now, does this mean that we will have a better result with one valve versus the other? Because it seems that if we look at lots of these data with uh, and look at patient uh, prosthetic to patient mismatch, that the risk seems to be much more pronounced when there is an intraannular valve, especially those with the balloon expandable valves. And in fact, we're seeing that the optimal devices in different clinical scenarios seem to favor the self-expanding perhaps in the small annulus. But none of these are randomized, prospective, randomized studies in large numbers of patients. But there is one that I'm very, very um, proud to be the co-PI with uh, Professor Cheche in, um, uh, from France and our PI, global PI, uh, Dr. Howie Herman, and that's the SMART trial. This is the small annulus randomized to Evolute or Sapien trial as a prospective multi-center international randomized control post-market study. The very first one to look at one valve versus the other in a specific population, men and women were enrolled, but I can tell you already that 80% of the patients enrolled are women. They're all comers with a small annulus. They had to have a risk of mortality at 30 days, less than 15%. So um, very important that we um, wanted the low uh, uh, preoperative risk patients as well as the intermediate. And they had to have severe native calcific aortic valve with a as well as a failed surgical bioprosthetic aortic valve. We did do TAV in SAV in those patients. The annulus measurement was actually defined for small annulus of an area of less than 430 millimeters squared. We published the design paper in the American Heart Journal. We brought in 90 sites, mostly in the US and Canada, some and many in Europe. And you see them all listed here in the different countries. And our co-primary endpoints is these two. First, mortality, disabling stroke or hospitalization, valve-related or worsening uh, rehospitalization for valve-related or worsening heart failure. And second, which is the second co-primary, just as important as the first clinical endpoint, is the bioprosthetic valve dysfunction, which is a composite 
of hemodynamic structural valve dysfunction with a gradient being greater than 20 millimeters of mercury or non-structural valve dysfunction with severe PPM or uh, moderate, uh, greater than or equal to moderate aortic regurgitation, thrombosis, endocarditis, and aortic valve reoperation or reintervention. The SMART trial is powered also for very important secondary endpoints, looking at the female subjects, bio, uh, the, the, um, the important dysfunction there, bioprosthetic valve dysfunction in our female subjects, hemodynamic structural valve dysfunction at 12 months, aortic valve mean gradient as a continuous variable at 12 months, effective orifice area as a continuous variable at 12 months, and the rate of moderate to severe prosthesis patient mismatch at 30 days. All of these are powered in this study. So we're very, very proud to tell you for the very first time that we are finished enrolling patients and we're just waiting for the follow-up. So a year from now, you will see the results of this very important trial. So the take-home messages, ladies and gentlemen, is the fact that there is no universal definition for small annulus, so we need to define this. About 90% of these patients with small annulus are women. The outcomes are sever or worse in those patients with a small versus a large annulus. And the outcomes of TAVI are similar regardless of annular size. So it's very possible that TAVI may be superior than sever in those patients with severe aortic stenosis and small annulus. These are only observational studies no randomized trial has been done in small annulus versus surgery. And whether or not a self-expanding or a balloon expandable valve is better will be the subject of the SMART trial, which has been completed in its enrollment and it's in its follow-up. I want to thank you for your attention, and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you so much for having me, all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Meran. Thank you, Roxanne, for this excellent uh, talk. Uh, you highlighted the importance and uh, the difficulties associated with small uh, annulus, particularly in the female uh, gender. Uh, having said that uh, the outcome with TAVI, even in those with small annulus, is better than the surgical approach. Do you think that this is, should be one more reason for proposing TAVI in younger uh, female subjects with, uh, let's say, having a 60 years old uh, young lady with uh, a small annulus would be in favor to undergo a TAVI instead of a surgical uh, replacement of the aortic valve? Well, that certainly is a, is a perfect and a beautiful question, Professor Sufis. Uh, there's no question that this would be um, one of the things for us to think about. You know, in the um, early TAVR and the TAVR that basically is in the asymptomatic TAVI uh, population that we're looking at it even earlier, we should be looking at um, uh, some of these important questions that you have whether or not a study like that will ever be done will leave us to uh, to evaluate that. But certainly, um, it is going to be very, very important. Have her first, I think, especially in small annulus. Thank you. If George and Stamatis uh, are still with us, uh, can join uh, say the panel in order to have uh, a discussion. Uh, may I have asked um, both uh, of you, Stamati and uh, um, Roxanne, uh, now we have many patients who will undergo TAVI with concomitant coronary artery disease and also with some degree of mitral regurgitation. And uh, Stamatis, how difficult and which is the best way to evaluate it, um, the degree and the severity of mitral regurgitation in order to decide whether we will go for TAVI. I'm discussing if you have a patient 75 years old, let's say 78 years old, old not a very uh, elderly person, where both options for aortic uh, replacement could be uh, acceptable, TAVI or surgical replacement. But in case of moderate mitral regurgitation, in some case we expect that after TAVI there will, there will be a regression in the, in the degree and the severity of mitral regurgitation. 
but in some case, this is not what would happen. And so, after a successful study, six months or one year later, we face the problem of how to manage the uh, severity of uh, uh, mitral regurgitation. What do you suggest in these cases? Yeah, um, it's a great question, uh, Professor Chuvis, and uh, we come across this uh, all the time. And uh, I mean, always we fix uh, first the aortic valve uh, with the hope that the MR will get better, you know. But sometimes, of course, we're talking about patients uh, with high surgical risk because if the patient can undergo surgery, the best would be to go for double valve uh, surgery. But uh, assuming that the patient is a high risk patient for surgery, we fix the aortic valve and then, uh, you know, you hope that the MR will get better. But if it doesn't get better, then today, uh, at least here, you know, we have uh, uh, several options. One, of course, is uh, after you do a TE and evaluation of the of the cause of the MR, you know, is uh, different options. One is a clip or uh, now we have uh, if the, the patient goes evaluation for uh, if it's a candidate for uh, a valve replacement percutaneously. So those are the options that, uh, that are available today, I, assuming that the patient is also uh, under aggressive uh, uh, medical therapy, guided, directed uh, medical therapy. If you still have MR, then uh, matraclip or valve replacement, if the patient is a candidate for. Mm -hmm. Based on, uh, on your experience, uh, is what should be the durability of um, TAVI today. We have experience from, uh, let's say, more than 10 years. Do you think that uh, durability of TAVI should not be an issue starting uh, implantations in younger patients? I, I, would, I would be a little bit careful about the durability of both the surgical. I mean, I don't, I'm not so sure that we know the durability of the valves versus the surgical valves so, so well, right? I mean, it seems to me that the TAVR procedures are lasting very, very well. We are now doing a lot of TAV and SAV for failed surgical prosthesis. Um, I think it's uh, really important to figure out this issue of the um, biomechanical failures that occur early on in terms of uh, the uh, subclinical um, a thrombosis and um, the fact that it could be something that leads to an earlier degeneration. Uh, we just don't know enough about it. And there was a, a question in the chat about the low anticoagulation dosing in TAVR patients. And the fact is that we just don't know what's the optimal management of these patients. Remember that in Galileo, we used a lower dose of rivaroxaban, but it was in combination with antiplatelet therapies. We just know that we have to do less is more in TAVR patients. Uh, I'm studying factor 11 right now. Uh, factor 11 inhibition is a novel compound that's coming out that's going to be very, very exciting in 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 acute coronary syndrome, stroke, and atrial fibrillation. The bleeding profile of those important agents are extremely, extremely good. Uh, and um, it's very possible that we might have a way forward in giving anticoagulation without having the expense of bleeding with patients like that. And that's what we're really looking for at the moment. Uh, so the durability of the valve is the biggest question and the lifetime management of a patient with aortic stenosis. Whether do you go with a younger patient who presents with a surgical valve, then you come in with a TAVR, or do you come in with a TAVR and then you put another valve and then you go to surgery? I mean, it's very complicated and we need to figure out how best to manage these patients in the best possible way for going forward. There's no question we, about that. Indeed, we, we face this problem, particularly in Greece. And also, we know that the guidelines recommend uh, over 65 years old, old uh, and bioprosthetic valves should be, let's say, preferred instead of the mechanical one. We know the problems of arteriocoagulation associated with mechanical valves, but at least the durability of those valves is very, very well established. Now, the patients underwent a surgical procedure uh, they have in, a, let's say, a bioprosthetic valve. Unfortunately, now the average, let's say, duration of this is very, very small, six, five, six, ten years. And then we are doing TAVI. 
I think it's it's a difficult uh, uh, problem how to manage and what to recommend to, to our patients. Yeah. There's no question about that. Go ahead, Sam. No, no, I mean, this, uh, yeah, as uh, uh, Roxana said, this is a very difficult uh, issue and we come across this all the time. But also this is why it's important uh, to have also discussion with the patient. You know, the patient has to present all the options and also it's his decision. We have here some patients that they don't want open heart surgery, you know. They want to avoid open heart surgery. So at least I think the good thing is that we have many options today, you know. Uh, so we have many options to offer to the patient. We have to have the patient involved in the discussion in the, and also in the decision. And uh, also we have a hard team approach. So we have covered all the angles. So I think we're in good shape. We'll become in better shape in the future, I think. Yeah. Also, you mentioned, Stamatis, that uh, now in your practice, it's not allowed, let's say, to have uh, more than trivial uh, PFL, PFL uh, link uh, after the tab. But while you are in the cath lab, how you, let's say, estimate the degree, the severity of PVL? Of yeah. course, it's not MRA, it's not... Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, you know... You, 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 your practice does to be based on the orthography with all the limitations. You yeah, use yeah. both echo and um, uh, orthography. What should be, uh, let's yeah, say... That's, your, a, that's a good point, Professor Sufis. And, uh, you know, sometimes, as you know, with orthography, you see AI and then with echo, you don't see anything, you know, or the opposite, you know. So, I mean, as a cardiographer, I and also, uh, of course, you need experience uh, and we have done uh, many cases, you know, but uh, I think echo is uh, to take all the views, though, you know, because you cannot only, like, get the parasternal. And we use transthoracic echo in now 80 85% of the cases. Uh, we use transthoracic echo. So if you get... Uh, all the views, you know, like parasternal views, the apical views, mm -hmm. uh, subcostal views, uh, and if you don't see AI, and also you also get off-axis views, you know. Uh, so if you do a complete evaluation by echo using all the views and of the axis views, and you don't say AI, AI, you are pretty certain that it's uh, most like, I mean, not AI. And if you confirm it also with orthography, that's better. Now, how you do the grading? Uh, with transthoracic, I mean, with experience, with the eye, you know, uh, if you see more than a flame of a PVL, you have a mild PVL, you have to do something, you know. We are very aggressive in trying to treat uh, more than minimal PVL, assuming that there is no calcium in the annulus and the LVOT to have a risk of uh, rupture. We try to treat uh, every more than minimal PVL aggressive, aggressively with balloon, uh, post-balloon dilatation. Thank you. And also, uh, Professor Meran, now with uh, your great experience in this uh, area, uh, PCI in a TAV patient continue to be a challenge and an issue. How do you think that we will manage it? I think obviously it's a very important one, right? That's another reason why to think about which valve type is most amenable to access to the coronaries. And it's for that reason that we basically do a lot of, we do perform coronary angiograms or in the CTs, really figure out if whether or not, especially in the older patients who may have coronary disease, we rule out coronary disease uh, and try to figure out the valve types. And uh, obviously access to the coronaries have been a little bit better with the balloon expandable valves. And depending on what that height of the coronary is, uh, with the annulus and we make those important choices. Um, I think the future, as we move forward, uh, we have to be thinking about that. If there's multiple valves and valves and then there's coronary disease, we don't wanna be jailing the coronary arteries in a patient who's had a previous TAVR. And certainly, you know, a STEMI, let's say in the setting, if you go younger and younger, you start to have these issues where these same patients can present with a STEMI, for example, or other things. So it's going to be a very important evaluation for us to kind of uh, put this on the on the map of how we care for these patients in terms of coronary access, uh, the bioprosthesis durability, uh, antithrombotic and anti 
antiplatelet regimens that have to be coming forth and how and when we choose which valve in which patient and when. So yeah. really, really good question. Thank you. And there is also one more question from Costas Asnauridis uh, for you, Stamatis. Are there any cases where uh, transesophageal echo is necessary during the TAV implantation? Yes. Uh, hi to my friend, uh, to my good friend, uh, Costas. But uh, yes, so as I say, uh, about 80%, 80-25% of the time we use transthoracic echo. We use um, uh, TE. Uh, when we have a bicuspid valve, with, uh, especially with our topathy, uh, when we do valve in valve, uh, valve in uh, bioprosthetic valve or valve in uh, TAVI that we start doing uh, lately. So only those particular cases will do, um, we use transophageal echo. The most of the, or if we have very high risk uh, LVOT and uh, annulus, and we are worried about uh, possible rupture, you know. And we have to have something immediately to know immediately uh, if something happens. But uh, those are the only cases uh, that we use uh, transophageal echo, 10 to 15 percent of cases. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, we are very close to, uh, to finish uh, the, our session. I would like to ask from you, Professor Meran, from you, Professor Leraiz, if you would like to have the last uh, comment before thanking you and Jane for being with us uh, this night. Uh, I mean, uh, Professor Meran, you want to go first? or No, no, that's okay. Uh, you can go first, Sam. No. <laughs> okay, I mean, uh, it's uh, fantastic. You know, this brings, as I say in the beginning, uh, all memories. I think it's a fantastic uh, forum for the young people to learn. And also, we want to thank you for uh, this great invitation uh, and to be, to be part of this uh, series of uh, lectures. And thank you and uh, whatever we can do to help... Uh, uh, you guys, I know you are very advanced anyway, but uh, whatever we can do to help uh, the young people, the young fellows, uh, we'll be happy to do at any time. Thank you again for the invitation. Thank you, Stamatis. Professor Meran? Well, I want to um, echo what Stam said. We really are honored to be included in this fantastic forum. Uh, teaching uh, the next generation of leaders is one of my passions, and, and I think that what you're doing here is setting examples for, for the rest of the world. Um, thank you for including me. Uh, thank you for uh, having a forum that allows participation from across the globe. I uh, really very much look forward to um, coming back to, to our second home in Athens for me. It's George's first home and only home, but uh, for me, it's a second home that feels very, very much at home with my colleagues uh, in Athena. So thank you, thank you so much for having me. Congratulations on this wonderful symposium. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Roxanne. Thank you, Stamatis. Thank you, George, for this uh, nice um, uh, today lectures. Looking forward to see you all uh, in person in Athens or in any other meeting. And uh, ευχαριστώ πολύ όλους σας, ευχαριστώ όλους όσους απόψε απολαύσατε τις ωραίες αυτές διαλέξεις και θα τα πούμε την ερχόμενη τρίτη πάλι. Ευχαριστώ πολύ, καλό βράδυ.